good afternoon. My name is Jay Watt, and on behalf of the Waterers Company, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here today. We thought we'd offer a little bit of uh, appropriate uh, distance uh, training here today, social distance training, uh, in uh, this difficult time. I do want to take this opportunity, though, to thank the uh, members of the fire service, also the private sector, uh, people that work on the fire apparatus as well, uh, for the job that they do. Uh, we definitely appreciate your sacrifice and, and what you do for us. A um, little bit about where we're at today. We're in the training area here at the Waterus facility. Uh, this is our hands-on portion, so the area of the training area. So I do apologize. Uh, if there's any issues with the acoustics and stuff in here today. Uh, but uh, a little bit about the Waterus Company. Uh, we are in South St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we have 210,000 square feet of office, manufacturing, and assembly uh, area uh, here at the facility. Um, we manufacture, assemble uh, all the components here for the fire apparatus and the fire, uh, fire excuse me, fire pumps. Uh, and um, we source product from the U.S. and Canada, bringing those items in, uh, machining them, and then assembling everything. Um, we also are involved with the uh, hydrants and valves. Uh, over here on the side, you'll see one of the hydrants that we manufacture, and uh, we do resilient wedge, water, uh, resilient wedge valves for the water uh, works industry as well. A uh, little bit about uh, the the presentation here today, if you would, uh, please share this live chat. Also, uh, like us, um, and also uh, ask good questions. Anything will be available. There's a gentleman in the back uh, that will be uh, taking your questions, and then he'll be passing them on, and we'll try to answer those during the, the class here. Uh, anything that we uh, can't get to, we will get uh, back to you uh, at, uh, after the class and stuff to respond to your to your question, all right? Uh, a little bit about the presentation, what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus primarily on this pump right here. This is the uh, CMU C20B. Uh, the model of the pump is a CMU. It's a CM pump, U designation means it's a large capacity pump. Uh, so from 1500 GPM up to 2250 GPM. Uh, we also offer another pump similar to this called the CS pump, uh, and then CSU being a large capacity as well for that application. Uh, the CM is a two-stage pump, which we're going to talk about and go through how a pump works, and then we're also going to talk about how a two-stage pump functions and operates. All right. Uh, some of the other pumps that we're going to be looking at uh, or just talking about, I guess, that you may have. Uh, this is a CXS PA, so this is a CXS pump, CX pump portion. S means that it has a ram form, form intake uh, that allows you to go up to 1500 GPM. Uh, the type of drive is our PA transmission. The PA transmission is run off of a power takeoff, off of a, the automatic transmission. All right, so uh, this is what we call though, an end suction pump or a pedestal pump. Uh, we supply just what you see right here. The truck manufacturer will plumb in the intakes and discharges, everything coming off of the pump to supply water to the pump and also get the water out uh, to the discharge. All right. Uh, the pump over here next to the, uh, the CX pump is our HLU. This is a high uh, a volume pump uh, along with a high pressure uh, uh, capability. So there's actually two impellers inside this pump. It's a simultaneous high pressure, high flow. So you can pump capacity to the pump, and while you're also robbing water off the discharge side of the pump, off this manifold, puts it into a high pressure impeller and allows you to create high pressure uh, at a lower flow. So usually about 60 gallons a minute at 600 PSI off of that high pressure side while being able to flow capacity of the pump. All right, over on the other side of the CM pump over here is our CRU C21-2. Uh, this will do 4,000 gallons a minute at 100 PSI. And this is more of an industrial pump, 
crash truck application, something like that. Um, the one thing I want to stress though, as far as pumps in general, centrifugal pump is a centrifugal pump. So the same basic parts or components uh, inside of here are inside the CM pump and the CX pump and the HL pump, all right? They use the same basic components. They use impellers, uh, stainless steel impeller shafts, mechanical seat. Packing on some pumps, and we'll talk about that here a little bit, uh, a little bit later. All right. Uh, as far as the CMU pump and the uh, application of it here and where it's used, uh, it's a midship mounted pump, is what we basically refer to these as, because it's in the middle of the fire apparatus. Uh, there's an, a drive line coming from the engine transmission that actually pass underneath the pump. Uh, connects to what's called the drive shaft on the front side of the chain case and then there's a shaft called the coupling shaft on the rear of the chain case that you connect another shaft to that goes to the rear wheels of the rear differential. Uh, so this is called a split shaft transmission. So we're either going to be in the pump position, so we'll be pumping it, or we'll be in the road position, so you're driving it down the road. We'll go through how that transfer case works. All right, we have six inch intakes that go out through the side intake, uh, off the, through the side panels. Uh, that's how you're gonna hook up to the hydrant, um, or if you're running a relay situation, uh, some way to get water into the pump. You also have what's called the tank to pump valve. This valve right here uh, is set up so your tank is right above it, and that'll be supplying water into the pump when you're operating off your uh, water tank on your apparatus. All right, um, as I said, uh, this is a, a two-stage pump being the CM model. All right, our smaller capacities just mean a CM. And again, once you add that U designation, uh, it's actually a larger pump internally. The impellers are a little bit bigger as far as the eyes, how we get water into it. Uh, and the passageways on the inside of the pump are larger. All right, so we get more water into the pump more water out of the pump. All right, let's talk in general, I guess, first just about centrifugal pumps, how they function, how they operate. All right, so we're gonna have a centrifugal impeller, all right, it's a bronze impeller, basically used in the fire service, uh, resistance to heat, resistance to the corrosion. The very center is the bore. Uh, this is pressed onto the impeller shaft. It's keyed on, so there's a keyway so in the, in the impeller and in your impeller shaft. So it's keyed onto the impeller shaft so it's gonna rotate whenever the impeller shaft rotates and you drive it, all right? Around the, and we're also gonna lock it axially. We'll use a nut, one of the end suction pumps here, the CX or the HL, use an impeller nut basically on the end of the impeller shaft to hold the impeller so it can't move forward. On the back of the impeller, we're gonna either use a snap ring, a shoulder, uh, C-ring, something to hold this impeller so it can't move actually on the impeller shaft. All right, around the bore is the eye. It's where the water comes to in the inside or inside the pump, comes in through the side intakes, comes into the eye of the impeller. Inside the eye of the impeller are the five blade-like things, and those are the veins of the impeller. That's what's actually going to create the centrifugal force to move the water out of the pump and actually create velocity with the impeller. We'll talk about those a little bit more here in just a minute. All right, around the eye is the hub area. All right, so this piece right here. So this is uh, used to restrict the flow of water from the discharge side of the pump, which will be up here, from the intake side of the pump. All right, so that's the hub of the impeller. You'll have a front shroud, you'll have a back shroud, and you'll have an exit way. Some way for the water to come out of. All right, so it comes into the eye, comes up through the exit way, all right? All right, so we have one that's cut away. We took the back shroud off of it, so you can see the veins, all right? So we're gonna put water into the eye, we're gonna rotate the impeller, all right? And the impeller has to rotate in a certain direction. It's gotta move in this direction, all right? It's gotta rotate like that. This is the working side of the vein, all right? It's hurling the water out of the impeller, out of the impeller and out the exit way. All right, and again, what the impeller is doing is adding velocity to the water. It's speeding it up, makes it move faster, all right? Um, part of the uh, 
pressure, as far as water pressure, any type of pressure, is basically you push something into a enclosed area, and you capture that to moving water, you create pressure in the, in the discharge side of the pump. That's what's gonna happen inside the pump here. All right, we're gonna bring water into the intake. It's gonna go into the eye of the impeller. It's gonna come out through the exit way. We're gonna hurl that water out into the discharge side of the pump. All right, and if you look at the way the pump is built, your intakes are towards the back, your discharge is towards the front. All right, so this is called the discharge manifold right here. All right, the discharge fittings are lined up on it. Discharge valves are attached to those. All right, so that water is being thrown into this front area up here. It's a, it's a sealed area, or you may want to call it a um, enclosed or captured area, sealed vessel. Basically, we're throwing that water into that sealed area that creates pressure, all right? And so what happens is when you open up a discharge valve, or up and open, so you open this valve up, open up your nozzle at the end of the hand line, um, it's actually at the end of that hand line is atmospheric pressure. It's low pressure. So that pressure, we were, or that water we were throwing into that discharge side of the pump is looking for some way to escape, side, top, wherever it can go. And it's gonna go out through that line, out to your discharge, discharge line out to atmosphere, right? And the pressure's gonna drop off, right? Because you just created a hole in your sealed vessel. So what we have to do is increase the RPMs, the velocity basically you're creating with the impeller uh, to get more water being thrown into the discharge side of the pump, which brings your pressure back up. If you increase the, increase the impeller speed, you increase the velocity to increase the pressure on the pump, all right? Um, so that's how we're going to create pressure on the, on the discharge side of the pump is moving it through this area, all right? And through the impeller and out to the, out to the discharge. All right, now centrifugal pumps, um, one of the big reasons that they're used in the fire service is they do take advantage of incoming pressure. So if you have a hydrant feeding you 100 pounds or 50 pounds of hydro pressure, basically getting this water flow coming in through the side intake, into the pump, what happens is it goes into the impeller, all right? Basically, the restriction is minimal, goes in. Remember, pressure is looking for anywhere it can go. So it comes in through the eye, out the exit way, out to the discharge side of the pump, all right? And what we're going to do by increasing the speed of the impeller, we're turning the impeller, is we're now going to increase that velocity of the water coming out through the exit way of the pump. So it does take advantage of incoming pressure. So if you are operating a pump at, or you're gonna operate at 150 PSI, you bring 150 pounds of pressure coming in, you only have to produce another 100 PSI for, to get 150 coming out of the pump. All right, and the, any centrifugal pump does that. Um, so you have a question? We have a question, okay. Uh, Colin writes, while pump testing doing the 50% capacity test on a 1500 GPM single impeller pump, the truck would start revving up and down. The only way we could stop it was to turn on the relief valve and turn it up past 250 PSI. What would be causing this issue in the relief valve? Okay. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, repeat it again? I'm while sorry. pump testing doing a 50% capacity test mm -hmm. on a single stage 1500 pump, the truck would start revving up and down. The only way we could stop it was to turn on the relief valve and turn it up past 250 PSI. What will be causing the issue in the relief valve? So we had it off to begin with? I guess, he, well, we don't know if you can ask him, can we? <laughs> that, that's what it sounded like. So you had the, the relief valve off, um, and it started to cycle and oscillate the way it sounds. So about one of the 50% test, um, and so they basically had an oscillation going on and the only way they could solve it was to turn the valve on and turn it above 250 PSI. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yes, it was off, you said. Okay. All right. So if it was off, um, should be no oscillation. 
Steve, you want to bring the pilot valve over here? <laughs> uh, What's that? We could get back. Yeah, maybe, I guess, from what we're trying to get into right now. Um, so you think the pilot valve is even fully there? I'm sure they don't. Yeah. So the valve, this is the pilot valve used on the, um, on the discharge relief valve system. You have an on off valve. All right, uh, if the valve is off, then in the off position, the water should not be getting over to this area at all. And I guess uh, one of the questions was, is the, were the lights fluctuating? Was it actually the valve was opening and closing? Uh, if it was, then this, there's something going on here in this area where it's not uh, completely uh, putting the water to the back side of the relief valve. Because that's what the on off valve does. In the off position, it takes the water in through the four-way valve, directly to the back of the relief valve, keeps the valve closed. Right? In the on position, it allows the water to come over into the needle valve area, and, and uh, you're using spring pressure to control that, um, the pressure being bled off the back of the relief valve, basically. Right? So it's possible that something going on in the pilot valve, uh, where it's uh, allowing the water to get over to this area, in the off position, all right? And we've got his information so we can get back to him um, if we have any more questions or go from there, all right? All right. All right, yeah, it's inside the pump, should, nothing should change. If you're putting RPM and rotation into those impellers, they'll stay creating the same pressure, all right? Um, the only thing that could change would be a flat valve or something like that, which we'll talk about here, how an actual two-stage pump functions here in just a second. All right, so like I said, impellers take advantage of incoming pressure. All right, so you've got 50 pounds coming in, 100 being produced, you've got 150 basically coming out of the discharge side of the pump. It's exactly what we're gonna do in a two-stage pump. So we're gonna use two impellers and basically get the water in the volume position, the impellers will work together. In the pressure position, uh, we're going to run, run the water through one impeller out the exit way into the eye of the second impeller, out through that exit way over to the discharge side of the pump. Volume is called parallel. Water comes in together, splits apart, um, then comes back together on the discharge side. We go into the pressure or uh, position, it's called series. The water will run through one impeller to the second impeller, and then out to the discharge side of the pump, picking up the velocity that each impeller can impart on the water to increase the pressure as it goes through the pump. All right. So the first stage impeller is going to be towards, typically towards the back of the pump. So this impeller right here is the first stage. This impeller here is the second stage. All right. Towards the front side of the pump. Again, the way this pump is set up, that's the front of the truck. The rear of the truck is to my left going towards the back. All right, so the water comes in, splits apart, right here in the intake adapters, all right? It's gonna split, go to the first stage impeller, and then go into the second stage impeller as well. So in the volume position, it's splitting apart, goes into the first stage. Let's say for conversation, we're gonna flow a uh, thousand gallons a minute at 100 PSI. We're gonna turn the impellers the impeller shaft fast enough so each impeller will, and both impellers will produce 100 PSI. Remember, that's velocity. That's how fast we're turning the impeller shaft. Um, water's getting, and then we're gonna, you know, each gonna flow 500 gallons a minute. So they combine for their capacity at the same pressure. So the first impeller, the first stage impeller is turning, throwing the water down past what's called the stripping edge, goes through what's called the transfer valve. And actually, it's a valve that's down on the underside of the pump. And it's a ball-style valve, and we're going to rotate that valve to switch from the um, volume position to pressure position. All right? So that valve actually will bypass water from the first stage side of the pump, either to the discharge manifold, or it will send it to the second stage in the pressure position. So in volume, excuse me, it's coming in. And there's also mentioned, uh, also there's a flap valve here on the second stage side of the pump. There's one on either side of the pump. There's one here 
uh, on the right side of the pump and then one over on the left side in this area as well. All right. right now they aren't used in the volume position. They're actually going to get pushed up out of the way when the water comes in to go to the second stage side of the pump. All right. So the water is coming in, feeding both sides. Water goes down through the transfer valve on the first stage side of the pump. Transfer valve is always on the first stage side. Goes through that valve over to the discharge manifold. All right, so you got 500 gallons a minute at 100 PSI on the discharge side of the pump. Second stage is doing the same thing. 500 gallons a minute at 100 PSI comes through this passageway to the discharge side of the pump. All right, so now we're sitting at 1,000 gallons a minute at 100 PSI, all right? So they, again, they combine for their capacity at the same pressure, all right? And what we're gonna do when we switch it over into the pressure position is we're gonna change that transfer valve. And when that transfer valve changes, we're gonna take that flow of water, all right, from the, from the second stage side, all right, or from the first stage side of the pump, rather than sending it into the discharge manifold, we're going to send it over into the eye area of the second stage impeller. It's out underneath here. Comes up, and it's going to pressurize the second stage inlet, second stage eye area. All right, but the first thing it's got to do is close the flap valve. Remember, the flap valves are pushed up from the water coming in. You've now got 100 psi water pressurizing the intake of the second stage, and it's going to shut the flap valve down. Closes the flap valve and that pressurizes the intake or the eye area of the second stage impeller and you're going to pick up the 100 psi that that impeller can produce. All right, so we basically uh, cut our capacity in half but we doubled our pressure. It doesn't always exactly double, so just the pressure will go up and you'll be flowing half the water that you were flowing typically before. All right, so but you can run the pump at a slower speed but producing more pressure, all right? Without having to change the RPMs of the engine, uh, you create more pressure uh, in the pump, all right? All right, so that's how a two-stage pump works and functions, all right? Uh, you may have, if you don't have a two-stage pump, you may have a single stage, most likely. Yes, sir, good question. Uh, we have a question from Sean Kelly. What is the difference in flow for a tank to pump valve going from three inches to three and a half? Um, our typical three and a half is right about 700 to 800 gallons a minute, somewhere in there. Uh, to get you that exact uh, uh, measurement, we'll have to get back to you. You know what it is, Steve, by chance? Uh, we don't manufacture a three inch valve. We do a three and a half inch full flow valve. All right, so it's a different manufacturer on that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get back and, and get, let you know that information. And I know you're going to get into sealing uh, uh, of a pump, but Chris Ford asked, what are the advantages between uh, packing and mechanical seals? Mechanical seals. All right. Uh, basically, what just real quick, what we're going to talk about um, on the next part here, uh, this is packing. All right. It goes into a stuffing box like this. This is a seal housing design started in 1994 with the body, CM body style, and CS also in that generation. But there's four pieces of packing pushed into a stuffing box, which we compress with the packing gland that compresses the packing down into the, around the impeller shaft. This seals the shaft off so it leaks marginally, all right? So it has to be leaking water for a, for a pa packed pump to operate correctly. You want to have water dripping out of that area uh, to cool the interface of the impeller shaft and the packing. For mechanical seal, this is the seal assembly. It's a um, silicon carbide stationary ring, carbon mating ring. So these two pieces are primary ring and then the mating ring here, but basically these create a seal where the seal turns against the uh, silicon carbide ring. So mechanical seals are designed not to leak. Packing is designed to leak, all right? Um, you can adjust the wear out of a packing, but it's obviously gonna leak all the time. Mechanical seals, uh, you don't have to worry about them, maintain them until something happens to the, um, to the seal, until it does fail, all right? So advantages and disadvantages, 
Um, the packing, you can get in and replace the packing without taking the transfer case off or the outboard bearing off and stuff to access it. But a lot of mechanics, that's one of their least favorite jobs is getting in to actually replace packing uh, and repack pumps. Uh, mechanical seals, you don't have to adjust them, but you do have to access the end of the impeller shaft to be able to change them out. But you haven't done anything to that point, or to, up to that point. Yes, Mark? Uh, Dave asks, how often does packing need to be changed? How often does packing need to be changed? Uh, actually, right now, depending on where you're at in the country, we don't have a recommendation on actually to have to change the packing. Um, it does have to be adjusted uh, to get that drip rate down. Drip rates typically on water is pumped between 10 and 120 drops a minute, uh, depending um, if you can pass the dry vacuum test. Uh, you can, you know, obviously the better closer it is to 10, the better it is for drafting and such. Uh, we just don't want to go down to the point where we don't allow any water to drip out of there or else you're gonna have an issue with uh, damaging the impeller shaft uh, and the packing and burning something up. All right, so we don't have a recommendation as far as how often it should be changed. All right. Uh, I did want to mention, uh, uh, as far as the single stage pump, uh, this is a dual suction eye impeller out of a CS or a CSU pump. All right, so it's got two eyes that feed a common exit way. This impeller would be mounted in the middle of this pump body, so it'd be very similar to the CM pump as far as how it's built. Intake fittings on either side, intake adapters, and pump body center section obviously would be different to accept the dual suction eye impeller. And this impeller would be fed on either side, water coming in, and then again being discharged out through a common exit way. So this is a single stage pump. There's no transfer valve, there's no flap valves, and again, you only have one impeller inside that pump. All right. The CR pump, the CX pump are all single stage pumps. There's just one impeller inside that pump body. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Now I mentioned a little bit before, we were talking about a little bit as far as mechanical seals and packing. Um, you do have to seal off the inside of the pump, obviously, so that water doesn't pour out and also uh, so that you don't get air coming in when you're trying to prime or draft with the pump. So there's an area of atmosphere as the shaft comes out of the pump body, there's one on the other side of the pump as well, when it goes out to what's called the outboard bearing. So we do use a bearing on the end of the impeller shaft to support that end of the shaft. This end of the shaft is supported in the chain case cap or the transfer case cap. All right, we're gonna seal this area off. The one in the CM pump here on the cutaway is a mechanical seal, which we've talked about a little bit already, but this, assembly here, you have a spring retainer, a spring, the bellows assembly. The bellows assembly is made out of rubber on the ID. You've got a polished carbon ring. On the end of that, you have a silicon carbide mating ring, all right, which is in the, ch the uh, seal chamber cup. So this piece right here is in a cover that'll go over the end of the impeller shaft. We're gonna install this mechanical seal onto the end of the impeller shaft. We have to use a special lubricant, uh, uh, rubber lubricant basically on the rubber portion and the bellows assembly on the inside. So we put that all over the bellows, all over the impeller shaft. We uh, push that onto the impeller shaft. We clean that surface with the uh, soft cloth and alcohol to get any fingerprints, grease, oil, anything that could be on that from the installation instruction. Uh, assembly, but you're going to, this gets pushed back inside the stuffing box when we put the chamber cover and the seal and the uh, stationary ring over the impeller shaft. So this gets pushed back in like that, all right? And then the rubber will adhere to the impeller shaft. So it's going to stick to it, all right? And what happens is when that sticks to it, it's in the compression of the spring pushing the the carbon ring up against the stationary ring creates a seal between the stationary ring and the carbon ring. And once that dries up and when the pump runs, this piece will turn against this stationary ring. All right, and that creates a seal between the carbon ring and the stationary ring so the water can't leak out through that area. It creates a seal on the bellows assembly where it's stuck to the impeller shaft. All right, and then there's an O-ring 
on the outside of the stationary ring uh, that's going to seal this in the chamber cover. So again, mechanical seals are designed not to leak. Running static doesn't matter, all right? But they are mechanical, so sooner or later they will leak, all right? Um, and then they need to be changed, all right? And how long they last uh, will vary uh, depending on the conditions they see. If they run dry, sand, sediment, that kind of stuff can get in there, and that can cause that interface uh, to wear and to create a leak, all right? Um, the mechanical, the uh, packing right, can go into this, goes into the same area. This is your seal housing again inside of a packed pump. All right, you're going to have uh, four pieces of packing that go into the uh, stuffing box. So we're going to stuff the packing or the mechanical seal into uh, create that seal. All right, so the packing goes in there. It's just a braided flexible graphite. So it's a graphite material with threads of graphite yarn woven into it. Uh, it's flexible, so it'll wrap around the impeller shaft, but you're gonna put four pieces in there. You stagger the joints by 90 degrees, um, and then you're going to compress the packing with the packing gland. It's a split gland, so these are actually two pieces. You've got a nut and a washer on what's called the, the packing stud, and you're gonna tighten those two nuts down to push the uh, packing gland back inside the stuffing box, which compresses the packing, which is going to limit how much water will come past to drip out of the pump. All right. This piece right here is called the lantern ring. This lines up with a cooling line on the bottom of the pump. There's actually one going to either side of the, of the pump, uh, to either uh, seal housing up into this area, but that's how water gets up into the packing area uh, to be able to drip out and cool the interface of the two pieces. This lantern ring is concave on the outside and on the inside. There are holes drilled through it. And when that water comes up, it pressurizes around the concave area on the outside, goes through the holes to the interface of the packing and the impeller shaft. And then it's going to drip out, again, atmospheric pressure, is gonna cause it to drip out of here, and that's what's gonna give you your drip rate, all right? So remember, mechanical seals are designed not to leak. Running static doesn't matter. But a packed pump is designed to leak, and you need to have uh, at least, again, between 10 and 120 drops a minute leaking out of this to cool the interface uh, of the impeller uh, shaft and the packing, all right? All right, so we've got uh, impeller shaft, uh, sealing off um, the end of the, out, coming out through the, uh, as the impeller exits the, the pump body. Again, and that's on both sides of the, of the pump. Uh, there is a, a uh, outboard bearing, again, to support this end of the impeller shaft. Uh, pumps built before 2006. Oh, yes, sorry, there's a question. Uh, question on mechanical seals. Uh, Somebody was told new mechanical seal cases had diamonds embedded in the ceramic makeup of the seals for extended wear life. Are you aware of that? I'm not familiar with anything like that. It's a, you've got a silicon carbide polished surface um, on the mating ring, and then we have a uh, carbon ring, basically the, um, call it the primary ring on the bellows assembly. Uh, but I'm not familiar with anything as far as having any diamonds embedded or anything like that into the into that body or into that material. So, another right. question from Max on pressure control. What is your suggestion on exercising the internal relief valve? Uh, the discharge relief valve. Um, again, looking at that over there, um, real quick. Come back here. I think you can move that fast. <laughs> All right. So this is the pilot valve for the discharge relief valve system. And the actual discharge relief valve is mounted right here between the intake of the pump and the discharge of the pump. All right, and what basically the, the valve is for is to uh, protect against uh, pressure fluctuations or pressure increases on the discharge side of the pump. If you're operating three hand lines and you shut two of them down without a relief valve system in place, you shut and uh, what will happen is the, all the pressure that was going out the two hand lines we shut down will now go through the one hand line so you get excess pressure, somebody gets, could get hurt. 
right? But the discharge relief valve, you have a pilot valve, you have an on-off valve here. This is a T-handle that's adjusting a spring back in here, and you have a strainer, all right? So as far as uh, exercising this, the best thing to do uh, circulate water, 150 PSI, you've got to be moving water through the system to, uh, to exercise it and to set it. Uh, you pull the strainer out, okay, valve's in the off position, pull the strainer out. Um, the gentleman that had you know, asked earlier about the situation that was uh, not working correctly in the uh, pump test, it's one of the ways to find out if this is bypassing. Off position, pull the strainer out. There's water coming out through this opening, then it's, it, the four-way valve is not sealing off the uh, passageway, uh, sending all the water over to the back of the discharge side of the pump. All right, but you pull the strainer out, off position, uh, there's two holes in this strainer. There's a cross hole that's drilled this direction, hole on the end of the strainer, uh, lead that's actually drilled up to the cross hole. It's got a 35 thousandths of an inch orifice on there. What you wanna do is take this off, make sure that's clean. Take a small piece of wire, run it in there, clean it off, blow through it, and make sure it's clean. If you have a uh, orifice that's plugged, you'll get a valve that'll hunt, um, or it'll be extremely sluggish. All right, so take that out, pull it off to the side, take your hand over the hole, turn it on, turn it off. All right, every time you turn it on, the water's gonna come to where the strainer was. It can't get to the back of the relief valve, so the relief valve will go full open, as far open as it can go, because there's no water pressure on the back of that valve. All right, turn it off. Now the water all goes to the back of the relief valve, closes the relief valve. All right, you do that a half a dozen, dozen times to exercise the actual relief valve. All right, put the clean strainer back in. Take all the spring tension off the T-handle. So back that all the way up, all right, and then exercise it again. All right, from the off position, turn it on. When you turn it on, now it'll come through the strainer, through the four-way valve, through the strainer, and now it's gonna push on this needle valve. And it's gonna push that needle valve and compress the spring and allow that water to go back into the intake side of the pump. All right, when you shut it off, go into the back of the relief valve, closes the relief valve, all right? Now you just cycle it on and off, all right? Chris, yes? He's also interested in Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Intake relief valve. Um, Gene is a nut. An intake relief valve works basically exactly the same way. You've got a valve here on the side, which is your pilot valve. All right. So this valve right here, set between 50 and 250 psi. You can't turn it with your hand like that. You're going to be using a um, spanner wrench or something like that to actually turn this uh, to adjust it. The actual valve is mounted over on the side of the pump over here. So this is your dump valve, right? So to exercise an intake relief valve, you need to have an incoming water source. So bring in 100 PSI from another pumper, set and take that valve over there, adjustment, go above 100 PSI, and then back down below 100 PSI, all right? Again, it works exactly like we just were talking about a little bit with the discharge relief valve, but you're now, you don't have, um, uh, a way to turn it on, turn it off. There is a strainer here as well. All right, take that strainer out, make sure it's clean. Uh, there is what's called a throttle screw, which is a little hex head or socket head kind of down on the bottom right here. All right, so take that out as well. It's just a little stainless steel rod that goes into a um, opening, which basically is the same as the orifice on the end of the strainer we took out from the discharge relief valve pilot valve. And that opening right there is how water gets to the back of the valve. All right, so if that is damaged or it's plugged up, the water can't get through to the back of the valve to close the valve. All right, um, check valve is there also. That allows water to go to the back of the valve. It does not allow air to be pulled up because this isn't going and connected all the way to the intake of the pump. So you will pull a vacuum inside this valve when you're priming the pump or pulling and drafting, if it is allowed to pull off the back of the main valve, so down here, it can actually cause that valve to open. And you'll be pulling air up into the main, main pump through the intake relief valve. All right. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
All right, let's talk about the transfer case. Uh, so we've got the, you know, we've got the pump, uh, how that operates in rotation, adding velocity, increases the velocity of the water, builds pressure. All right, so now with the transfer case, we're going to shift it between the road and the pump position. Right? Uh, the shaft coming in typically underneath, this is typically the way it's mounted, the rear mounted transfer case on the back of the pump. You will see some applications now, even more with some mid-mount aerials and some different applications where this transfer case will be mounted on the front side of the pump. Okay? But typically it's gonna be here on the back side. All right? but so the drive line running underneath the pump, you have what's called the drive shaft coming into the front or into the pump here, or transfer case here, all right? Uh, coupling shaft coming out the back. So you really have two shafts inside that case that are in line, held with bearings, but independent of each other, all right? And we have a drive sprocket. So this big piece right here with the uh, <clears throat> teeth on it, chain wrapped around that. Uh, should mention we are the only ones that use a chain drive in the industry. Um, very, very durable, a couple of reasons. Very durable as far as uh, how long it lasts and also quiet. There's no gear whine right, you, that you typically get with a, with a gear case. All right, so you have drive chain or the chain wraps around the drive sprocket on the bottom, driven sprocket on the top. Okay, and they are set up, if you look at the the way this is designed, basically, the impeller shaft assembly has to run, depending on the pump, 3,500 RPMs or more, depending on what you're, what you're running, the type of pump it is. But anyway, we have to have what's called a speed increasing ratio. So the input coming in from the uh, automatic and the engine coming out of the front isn't turning the pump fast enough, so we have to increase that speed. Most pump transmissions have about a two to one ratio. All right, so every time the large drive sprocket turns once, the driven sprocket, which turns the impeller shaft, turns about two times, uh, 2.27, 2.47, um, somewhere in there as far as the actual uh, ratio can change, again, depending on the engine and, uh, that, that's driving it. We also change what's called the drop, which is the center line of the impeller shaft to the center line of the drive line. We change this uh, for depending on where that pump and transmission is going to be mounted in relation to the engine, uh, and engine transmission. Truck manufacturer figures that out so we get the right drop from here to here. This is a B drop, we have a C drop, D drop, E drop, F drop. So longer drops uh, change uh, the driveline angles okay, to keep the appropriate driveline angles. All right? So we change that drop. That's why this is a C20B. We could have a C20C, D, E, F. The older cases before 2009, they were C10s. From 2006 to 2009, there were C10 transmissions. So you had a C10, B, C, D, E, F. Before that point, going back to the 70s, you had a Y chain case. So that was, a, again, a YBX, YCX, YDX. We changed those drops. All right, but how the transfer case works? Again, you have two shafts in line, but independent of each other. Uh, the drive sprocket has bearings, needle bearings on the bore, so the drive shaft is actually turning inside the drive sprocket. All right, so this is not attached to the drive shaft. All right, the way we're going to connect those two is using the collar. You can see the gap right here between the coupling shaft and the drive shaft going out the front. All right, so this collar right here is going to slide back and forth between the road position, push forward in the case, excuse me, pump position, push forward in the case, or the road position, push back. So right now it's in pump, and I'll switch this over into the uh, road position so it spans the two shafts. Right. So that collar just shifted into the road position. Now the collar is spanning the coupling shaft and the drive shaft going out the front of the case. So now you have one shaft running through the case to drive down the road, all right? And what we're gonna do, in, if you notice, there's a hub of teeth on the drive sprocket, same teeth as the drive shaft and coupling shaft. Um, we're gonna engage that set of teeth with the collar to go into the pump position. Do you have a question, Mark? Uh, we have a question from Jim in New Jersey. In what application is a two-stage pump the best choice? 
What application? Um, we're looking for <laughs> all of them, actually. Uh, so um, the, the two-stage pump, nobody can argue it's more efficient. Uh, to, run, to be able to run the most uh, uh, diverse flows and pressures, basically the two-stage pump will do all of them. Uh, it's most efficient anywhere you drop down off of capacity. A single stage pump is most efficient at or near capacity, the pump. Um, but uh, if you're looking for high pressure um, applications, you're, you got, that is the uh, most efficient pump you can get. Um, so you know, we do have some what's that? high rise applications, I was going to mention. Uh, we do offer what's called, you can take a three, take this pump and make it a three-stage pump. Uh, there's a number of large departments uh, that have those. But what it is, is we take the impeller shaft two stage, to a two-stage pump, put the impeller shaft out the front, put a CG pump, a CG impeller, on the end of that impeller shaft, and then we basically can bump the pressure even higher. And you're looking at, um, what's that? Take a drink. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I can take my voice is getting a little more in here. I apologize about that. All right, but uh, basically uh, we can bump that pressure as it goes through each one of the impellers. As it goes through, we can flow uh, 500 gallons a minute at 700 PSI. All right, to be able to uh, pump the water up to the high rise, up the high rise and the higher elevation. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, you also have a question regarding the transmission. Uh, Josh has had problems uh, shifting the pump. Uh, had a lot of problems shifting the pump. What are a few things to inspect? And he, he put in quotes, but budding. Yeah. Well, um, that was that's kind of the the two issues you're going to have with this not engaging. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we do have the teeth cut at a a pointed tooth, whatever, to try and eliminate what's called a butt tooth condition. It still happens though. Um, depending on the age of the truck, but those that, that pointing was done in 2003. Before 2003, it used a 25 degree angle on the collar and on the um, drive sprocket, <clears throat> and back into the 70s on the, on the coupling shaft. But basically, when it slides together, we want it to turn to get into the proper position. That's what the angling does, or the pointing does. All right? um, so that's it's, when it doesn't mesh, it's called a butt tooth condition. The teeth just slide, don't, don't mesh, whatever it is, it's called a butt tooth. The other the thing you can have happen is called residual torque. All right? And residual torque is the automatic would put out a rotation towards the reverse rotation in the neutral position which is one of the things going through a shift scenario uh, that we put it in neutral before we started the shift procedure and that can actually torque lock the collar onto the coupling shaft. The rear shaft is not going to move. It's stationary. It's not moving until the truck moves. So that collar rotates because of the automatic and that locks the collar into that position. All right, so going through a typical shift scenario, uh, you stop the truck, you put it in neutral, all right, you shift it into the pump position. All right, so when you shift it down into pump, the shift unit's gonna try and move that collar over into the, into the pump position. All right, so it slides over. All right, um, if that slides over, there's a, a light here on the shift unit, or there'd be a separate switch that would be on a bracket on an older style before the C20, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but that basically is, uh, tells you that you're in the pump position. So a butt tooth condition is the teeth just start meshing. They're going together. Okay, residual torque is a torque lock of the collar onto the coupling shaft, right, which doesn't allow it to release. Um, that's usually towards the reverse mode. Should mention also that the situation I would imagine, what, what was his name? Was, was it Josh? He, Josh was basically said that, uh, that was happening. Uh, a lot of times that's on older trucks. 2008-2009, uh, Allison changed the programming inside their uh, software, which basically um, causes the drive line to jog or to move when you do a pump request, when you're trying to shift it into the pump position. That residual torque and the um, uh, butt tooth conditions happen even on the C20s, but the automatics auto 
will automatically change that drive line to allow it to shift into the proper position. So if he's got something other than a, you know, if he's got a C20, a new one, we can talk about it a little bit, uh, as far as it shouldn't be an issue, but the older ones, uh, you typically manipulated the automatic to get it to go into the pump position. Because it's a reverse rotation on the drive line, when you put it, you have to actually go through your shift scenario, stop the truck, put it in neutral, uh, or set the, set the parking brake, uh, and then basically shift it into pump. You take your truck transmission, if it didn't go into pump, put it in drive, all right? That starts the rotation of the drive line. The collar, the teeth can, will line up, it'll slide into the proper position. Um, it releases the torque also uh, from the neutral drag uh, residual torque on the uh, drive line. If that doesn't work, go from the uh, neutral position or go from drive back into neutral, into reverse, back into neutral, and then into drive. You're trying to move the drive line. You can move that drive line. You're leaving that shift unit towards pump as well because it's pushing on that collar. And once you get it to line up, all right, it's gonna, what it's going to do is it's going to rotate this and it's going to push it into the proper position. Trying to manipulate the drive here to get it into the proper or get it into, into pump. All right? Again, manipulating the automatic. Um, something you should look at also, uh, check the override. Okay? Make sure the override's not hanging up on the on the um, on as an external arm or it's coming out where this key handle is right here. If that override is creating a binding, it's also going to affect that, um, that shift. All right. All right, so moving the collar back and forth, uh, you're going to, again, push it into the pump position, right? And that's going to engage with the drive sprocket. You put the truck in drive, and that's going to start turning your chain or sprocket, uh, turn your chain and operate your pump, all right? Uh, the taking care of the chain case, as far as uh, lubricants, uh, we're using an automatic transmission fluid. It's going to vary depending on the generation of the uh, case, whether it's a Y or a C10. Uh, those both were, took about 12, 13 quarts of ATF. Uh, the C20 uh, uses about six to eight quarts. All right. There's a sight glass on the side or the back of the transmission. Uh, you check that sight glass. Uh, make sure you've got the appropriate amount of um, uh, um, lubricant in there. Uh, checking that, you want to check it on a, a weekly basis. Uh, changing it, uh, you can change it uh, once a year or every six months, 100 hours of operating time. And what we're doing is we're basically looking, by checking it, you're looking for moisture. Okay, level is one thing, but moisture is the other one. If it starts looking like a strawberry milkshake, you're getting moisture into the case. It is something that happens naturally. Every time you run a chain case or run a transmission, you build up heat. You build up heat, you get moisture, right? Uh, there's different areas of the country as well. Uh, very humid areas um, or places with, very, with a real drastic temperature change, okay? That's gonna affect the moisture inside the cases as well, right? So we wanna take those, that, that lubricant and, and change it uh, to uh, keep good fresh lubricant in that, uh, in that system. Okay. Right? Yes? That's a good question from Josh. Mm -hmm. Well, from a mechanic's point and a firefighter's point, a lot of firefighters would be taught to shift the pump into the neutral position instead of throwing the lever straight into pump like it should be done. Could you explain why? Well, the, the neutral position was basically developed, we first developed the chain care, the shift into the air shift back in 19, um, it's late, late 80s, 89, somewhere in there. Uh, we didn't have a neutral position on that Front, uh, that uh, shift unit on the, the panel, or up in the cab, I should say, uh, until 1994. Uh, basically allowed people to test it, basically, is what that was for. That neutral position took air off of both sides of the shift unit, which allows you to, to shift it back and forth, uh, by manually, and to override it, all right? Um, shifting it from one position to the other, uh, we don't really want to get into the standard operating procedures of fire departments, how they want you to do it. Uh, but basically, you can move it from one position to the other. Stopping in the neutral position uh, does slow down a little bit as far as 
shifting too fast and stuff, which is sometimes we see the issue. They want to engage this thing too fast, and things are still trying to trying to turn and stuff. So um, you don't have to stop in the middle, uh, but basically it just you know, it was there to help you with an override situation. Right. We're at time for two more questions. Uh, one from Chad: Why did they switch from braided rope packing to uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Steve's giving me a hard time. Right now. <laughs> uh, just a second, I'll go through the, 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 the whole thing. Uh, actually, the old braided rope packing actually was an asbestos rope packing. So obviously why they went away from it. Uh, they went to a product called uh, Graph Oil in 1984, which was two soft rings packing and four uh, solid graphite pieces. And then we went to the braided flexible graphite because with the graphite material, it's flexible. Um, it doesn't dry out as much or as, as easily as the older style packing did. Uh, it's a little, and it's more forgiving. Uh, not gonna damage the shaft as, uh, as much as the older, older packing did. So it's got lubricating qualities. So it was kind of what we just had to go to something like Another question? Uh, from John, will auxiliary engine cooler transfer any heat from the engine into the pump in freezing conditions? Work opposite of its purpose. No, well the engine cooler is designed to cool the engine. Uh, that basically is outside the <coughs> pump arrangement. What will end up happening, your, in, your engine cooler basically goes, it's water that's in the tank. Basically, that gets flowed through that. So it's not the pump itself. I mean, we don't manufacture an engine cooler, um, but it's kind of downstream from the pump. So I guess in, you know, ultimately, yeah, it would, because it would affect the water that's in the tank. And that tank, basically, water is, you know, being circulated through. But you're trying also, you're trying to move that water in freezing conditions to warm that pump or keep it warm anyway. So you're not trying to overheat it. You're trying to um, keep the pump from, that's one of the problems you have, I guess, with, with cold conditions. If you don't circulate water, uh, you, it will freeze, especially small lines in the pilot valve and the drains and primary, those areas and stuff where it's gonna be exposed to the freezing conditions. Uh, any other questions? Um, feel free to get a hold of us. I hope you enjoyed the uh, presentation. Uh, my voice is a little, little sore here. So, uh, but anyway, uh, again, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your input and stuff, for the questions. Really appreciate those. Uh, if you, again, like us, um, send us more questions anytime. Uh, anytime that you uh, have uh, questions at all, feel free to call the service department here at Waters. Uh, Work open with the fire service and obviously all the repair facilities and stuff. Um, so I do appreciate your attention and hope you got something out of it. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Be safe. All right.